we're just going to talk for a while tonight. Trying to see something that few human beings ever know exist because they have no interest in it. And we don't very often use in this group for good reasons, we don't very often use words such as beautiful or wonderful, not too often, because the associations with them are usually all wrong. But tonight we're just going to talk and see and try to feel, rightly feel, the beauty of truth itself. If you could if you could see it if you could feel it you'd never put anything on earth before it not your career not your future you wouldn't put the past before it which you are now doing unfortunately you're all slaves of the past every one of you The beauty of it is, as I, I'm speaking personally now for a minute, for a minute, the beauty of it is that I, am I as I am sitting here now, can be free of everything connected with thought that connects me with anything that is nervous, that it's unhappy, that worries about tomorrow. Right now, I can be free of anything stupid, anything cruel, anything mechanical that I did one minute ago or 30 years ago. You would better see this you had better see your talent, your ability to instantly and totally cut off the world you were in one second ago. Oh, but the, there's a big problem, an enormous problem. It's all right. We're, we're willing to work hard here. Willing to put forth new effort. The main problem that stands in the way, the barrier that stands in the way of me or of you being totally at ease right now in this room and forevermore is my inability to recognize the following, among other things, in myself. I am unable to recognize artificial behavior as artificial. I'm unable to recognize weakness as weakness. Gullibility as gullibility. Blabbing instead of thinking clearly. The need to make an impression instead of being myself naturally right now. This means that I have not used my mind on its own level, as we talked about earlier in the evening, to observe, to register, and to see the way I just behaved a second ago. Remember we had a project one time in which you were asked to ask yourself what did I just think? What did I just think? You try this first of all and see how difficult it is. But what gold? If I can see the thought I just had 
I can then begin to recognize these barriers to being here right now that we've been talking about. I can see how I said to you <coughs> what I said in a state of unconscious division. Now was, I was tense in making that statement to you. And a part of me wishes that I didn't have to say it, say it. But I don't know any other way to behave. And I never will until I begin to see, boy, get this, until I begin to see my actual real motives for saying what I say, for doing what I do, for thinking what I think, my actual motives for it. then I can see what I don't need. Then I can see what I don't need from society, from you, or from myself. Because in my confusion I've set up certain standards of behavior, of what I should achieve, and not for one instant do I recognize that I myself, in cooperation with a mad society, have made certain demands on me, on how I should appear, how I should behave, and what I should have. I can begin to see what I don't need from you, what I don't need from my parents, from society, from my wife or husband, what I don't need from anyone because I'm trying to get something artificial to keep the artificial self in place. When I begin to suspect the state that I'm in now, the state that I'm in now, with that insight, I will go on to the next step, which means I can drop it right now, and after having made that artificial remark to you, because I thought you expected me to make it, I see that I made the artificial remark because it was the thing to say, the thing to do. Maybe for the first time in my life I can give myself a conscious jolt <coughs> of stopping in the middle, all right, nine tenths of the way through, of the behavior drop it and be free of it right now you try it sometime are you following you're at work you're at home you're in the car driving and you can pay attention you're not in too thick of traffic so you can pay attention to your own thoughts And you have determined to wake up. Let me add something. Let me interrupt myself. You have determined to take a new responsibility for yourself instead of letting other people think for you. And you can stop this emotionalized thought right in the middle of it while walking across the room. You will then walk across the other half of that room a new kind of human being on earth because you'll be walking across now you'll be walking consciously you'll be walking free of nervousness
just wondering if any of you actually do this daily. Do you? Could I see your hand, please? If you... you no? All right. Maybe, you, maybe some of you even imagine that you're giving yourself this conscious necessary shock treatment and you're simply imagining that you are doing so. How, how, I better uh, start from another angle. How many of you are, are nice people? <coughs> nice people? How many of you are nice people? Do you know what it means to be nice? Huh? Okay, let's see what it means to be unnice. First of all, to be unnice means to punch yourself with a psychic fist all day long. I said punch yourself all day long. Punching yourself means to be jealous, to be in despair over a habit you can't break, to feel that uh, heaven has cheated you, to feel that other people aren't loyal to you and grateful to you. This is what is known as, oh, maybe you don't understand this, maybe I better put it stronger. This is what is known as destroying yourself all day long. So that by the time you're older, another 10 years from now, you'll have done it so thoroughly and have covered it up so thoroughly that you'll want to uh, explode in one way or another. And if it can't explode outwardly, you'll explode inwardly. And then in a certain crisis, in a certain crisis, you'll break down and all the world will see what a big phony you have been all your life. I don't know how many more years you want to continue to live the way you've lived in the past. Don't you understand that payday will come? Oh, you have it made, I see. You have a nice income, a nice career. Or if you don't have that, you're young, and that will surely come in time. You have a good sex life. You're reasonably attractive. Your health isn't too bad. And what's going to happen to you? I'm asking you a question. What's going to happen to you when you lose your sex partner? When you use your, lose your youth? Lose your family? Lose your health? Lose your money? What are you going to do with yourself when that crisis comes up? How are you going to handle it? Oh. You say, then I'll read a spiritual book or I'll join a spiritual group or I'll find my escapes in one way or another. I have just given you in the last three minutes <coughs> a biography of practically every human being who's ever existed on earth. Is that what you want? You want to die afraid? Oh. 
I'm going to ask you something else. What are you clutching? What are you hanging on to? I'll guarantee you, you're going to lose it. Then what are you going to do? See, in this group, we're not allowed to fool around anymore. We're not allowed to deceive ourselves anymore. And we're not allowed to deceive ourselves into thinking that if I just come every to every meeting and read every book and a little bit obey the instructions, that I'll make progress. I hope I hope someday you see the depth the horror of your personal life because ladies and gentlemen this will be the only chance you have you know you can come to this group just like you'd come to go to a, a church or a psychological <coughs> clinic or any kind of a self-help group, you could come here and deceive yourself just as easily as you have perhaps deceived yourself in the past by going to these other groups. So this beautiful state that we talked about at the beginning is not possible at the present moment as long as the past destroys it whenever the present moment comes up the past being the past being every single experience or emotion or idea that I have which I wrongly connect with a sense of self which means beautifully that I can have any experience that comes to me and be untouched by it because I am not falsely alive to the experience. Let me tell you a terrible blunder you're all making. This crisis, this shock that you may meet tomorrow or five years from now, or 20 years from now when you lose your family and lose your health and lose your youth and lose your sex prowess and lose your beauty and lose everything else incredibly incredibly there's a part of you that looks forward to the pain of this future crisis you know why because if all your life the only thing you've known is polluted water that is what you look forward to to keep you what you call alive which brings us to a, a point as long as I and give me, and am getting a feeling of life a feeling of being someone a feeling of being vibrant as long as I'm getting feeling of life out of my shocks out of my misery I have cut off all possibility of change of living in this here and now that we're talking about Do you know people, relatives, friends, or maybe yourself, to use a common phrase and you recognize it, do you know people who thrive on trouble? Huh? 
And if you were to present them with a perfect solution for their unhappy marriage, for their unhappy mind, for their unhappy life, if you were to present them a gift, here is the key, the answer to your unhappiness, they would reject it. Because, again, darkness wants nothing to do with light. Sickness wants nothing to do with health. Sick, sickness, you know what sickness loves? You know, don't you? Sickness loves sickness. Neurosis loves neurosis. Hatred loves hatred. Trouble loves trouble. I ask you to examine the pattern of your daily life at the office at home. Look at the pattern of it. And now you tell me what kind of a human being you really are. Now you know, don't you? Do you have troubles? You're a troublesome person. You have, you have taken your nature, your level of being, and you must project it into the outer world. You must. It's all one world. It's all one thing. And then you have the nerve you have the incredible nerve to complain about the troubles that come your way. Are you able to take the simple, plain fact that you are your trouble, that you are your problem, this is the whole business? Or, are you going to make the mistake of thinking, I am nice, but the world is wicked, which everybody does. I asked you a question once, and I'll ask you again. If everybody in the world was just like you, what kind of a world would it be? That makes you think, doesn't it? Doesn't it? How much longer are you going to sit in this class and play the game with yourself? When are you going to get down to business? When are you going to get really serious? When are you going to get to the point where I can look at you as you come in the door or as you sit down? And I can look at you and I can say, this lady, this man, this man, this lady can take one ounce more today than they could take yesterday. Because then you'll get it. Then I will give you something that you can take without it being twisted and distorted and falling on your vanity and on your hurt feelings. Whatever you do, whatever you do, and those of you listening to this tape, pay attention to this. This is for your sake, you understand, not mine. I'm responsible for me, you're responsible for you. Whatever you do, don't miss what you're getting in this room. And you're getting, unknown to yourself, a thousand times more riches than you can presently 
assimilate. What a shame that this goes right out that door there. I want to be, and you want to be, in an inward condition where I am no longer, no, no longer at enmity with myself, with myself, and therefore no longer at enmity, enmity to a mad world. If I am really sane, I said, if I'm really sane, how can I be at enmity with a mad world? I can see the madness. And incidentally, when you really see the madness, you know there's nothing you can do about it. Look at the trouble you're having with your own madness. Look at the trouble you're having being sane yourself. Okay, what signs of lack of sanity did you experience today at home? The curt remark? The wishing that someone else would behave according to your desire? So I will tell you finally, each of you in this room, I want to tell you, I want to tell you what you're missing when you come here so that maybe you can begin to take a little bit more and get a little bit more each time you come. You're missing so much because you don't know how solidly you're standing in your own way. I know, and this is why I treat you gently not with compromise but very gently <clears throat> if there is no put everything together if there is no roughness in you How can anyone treat you roughly? Or is the roughness your resistance to the truth? You have no idea how easy it is for you in this room. And what a shame. a shame that it isn't much more difficult for you because that means you're working on yourself you're becoming conscious of how you can't take the slightest rebuke without feeling bad so we are all going to tonight start all over <clears throat> have the right resolution that tonight is going to be a fresh start and the way we're going to start is no longer tolerating my own childishness my own immaturity I am NOT going to put up with it that man said something at the coffee break that that woman made a facial the expression that upset me I'm not going to tolerate my neurotic response anymore no I used to get mad at him or her no more I'm gonna see what a little little child I am who gets mad at everything and I'm not going to tolerate it anymore I'm going to get well 
because I'm sick and tired of being sick. I'm going to get healthy. Heaven help me. I'm going to do it. And some of you may know what I'm going to say lastly. And it's very beautiful. Every time I say, or you say, I'm going to plunge into this thing, and heaven help me, heaven will. Truth will help me. God will help me. Rightness will help me. Because I put myself on its side, on truth's side. And it will never fail me. Never. How's that for beauty? Real beauty. We'll have open discussion and Joe has a question, but first let me let me go over the ground just just once more. Do you have any idea at all of how easily you can be disturbed? How easily you can be thrown? How touchy, how sensitive? Oh boy. How childish you are? For heaven's sake, grow up. I'm going to give you a great spiritual esoteric truth. Grow up. <laughs> or remain hurt, scared little kids. And the way to grow up is to be able to take properly, correctly, an affront, as you call it, to your little vanity. Someone doesn't answer you the way you want them to, and so I see a startled look on your face. You're gone. The crisis of the ages is upon you. I wonder whether you hear five words of any talk because then you get up during the coffee break and behave exactly as if you came in a half hour late. Ask the question. Again. In your book, the power of your supermind. You say, yes. say by letting go, just, just let it go. Get out of your own way. Um, that the answer will come. It'll just come to you through insight or any. Okay. Any any way. Fine. I I've been doing this, but I have a maybe a deep seated fear that when it comes, I'm going to miss it. <laughs> Um, or I, or my negativity is going to get in the way and say that's that's more baloney got coming in and that isn't the right answer. Do you know what blocks the answer? The answer with a capital A. Your concern over the answer. Can anything good come out of worry? Out of concern? Don't you see that the concern, the anxiety, the worry, is this right? Is it wrong? Is it good or is it bad? This nervous state is, is now blocking the answer. Why do you, why do you like to worry? Why do you like to be so anxious over what's going to happen tomorrow? Why do you love your misery? When you cease to love your anxiety, 
The answer is there. And it won't be at all what you thought it would be. Because what you thought it would be would be your conditioning and what you wanted it to be. To make you feel secure, to make you feel good, to make you feel liked, to make you feel that you're at last a spiritual attainer. Why, why do you like to worry? I hand you a key which will unlock... Now that I'm trying to get an illustration. I hand you the answer. You refuse it because your worry is so valuable to you. You won't give it up. I've told you, give it up. How many of you worried today? How many of you, I'll see you. How many of you worried today? Huh? Today. In the last... How many of you... Why? I'm asking you, tell me, why? You think it's necessary for one thing? Well, of course it's necessary to worry. How else can I handle it? How else can I handle this, this fear that I'm going to lose that person or that customer? I've got to do something about it. And so all you know is worry. of you worry that you'll never get this that you'll never understand this that is what's blocking your understanding you would rather be you than understand and that is your blunder I will repeat you would rather be you than to understand. You understand that? Huh? No? You are your worry. How much you love your worry because you love you. But the you has to be in quote marks. Because it isn't you at all. <coughs> It's a, it's a force, an imp, that has taken over your life, and you have shaken hands with it, and become buddies with it, and wouldn't know what to do without it. You have blended with it. You have become it. You think that the end of the imp is the end of you, which it is. Thank heaven. We are in open discussion anytime you want to talk, you can. Vernon? Yes, Jim. I think at the last thing you said, well, ask heaven or ask God or ask, you know, do, do you advocate one eye talking to the other eye or, or... Make that clear, Jim. Do you advocate verbally asking Talking to yourself? Talking to yourself? No. Talking to yourself? How do you ask? I mean, is it, is it, no, I mean, like... Make the question clear, Jim. Well, I think, I don't know, toward the end of the last tape, when we just broke for, you said, well, maybe I didn't hear it properly. I thought you said ask. All right. Well, let me, let me go ahead with it. Certainly there is a part of me part of you that asked for something different something different that part's fine for heaven's sake we're asking for something new by being here tonight that's great go ahead Rick. no I was trying, oh. to, do, I was trying to, do, to uh, tell you what he meant when the last part you said may heaven help me and then you said 
and it will help you. Okay. Do you know who helps you? There's only one thing on earth that can help you. Now, I'm going to tell you what it is. It is God. It is truth. It is rightness. It is understanding. It is consciousness. Which is you without the word. You without the label. You without the thought about you and about who you are. I don't know how many times I've quoted, and I'm sure Joan has almost counted by this time, the phrase, I and my Father are one. To Christ, this was a fact. He and God were one. Why? Why? Because he practiced what he preached. That is, he died to the old nature. The seed fell into the ground and died. Therefore, he had no human personality at all, except the, obviously the physical, and he had a physical body, and he, his voice had a certain pitch, and he may have gestured in a certain way, and he may have walked slow or fast or whatever was natural to him on the physical level, but he had no self, he had no I, he had no me. Therefore, therefore, he could say, I and God are one thing. When I die while still alive, there's only one thing. God, me. One thing. So what is real niceness? To die to human personality so that only truth remains. <coughs> it starts, obviously, with a spark. An ounce. This is what helps us, Jim, because along with this first hint, first different part of me, different I, you want to call it that? Letter I, not these kind of I, letter I. Along with that comes a right feeling. Boy, I can sense it. Man, I was mad for most of my life. But I can sense something different. And this, this is, ah, this is what Christ was talking about when he said the kingdom of heaven is within. I know that's right. It's that little, but I know it's right. Nothing can take that away from me. That is what helps me. Because boy, now I'm really excited. I want to be more of myself, of my real nature. Then I go through a terrible sorrow, a terrible sorrow. I have to give up my misery. It's just terrible. Ask anything, but don't ask me to give up my tears my hatreds and my violence don't ask me to give up my anguish which do you want I'm asking you which do you want do you want the truth that sets you free or do you want yourself which is your anguish Take your choice. It's up to you. You want your vanity? Take it, but you can't have truth, too. You want your bitterness over what that uh, ex-husband did to you? Have your bitterness, but you can't have the truth. Make up your mind.
We all want to know the way out of our present state, a way to get rid of this awful ache, this feeling of being dominated by other people and by our own neurosis, of being suppressed, of being told what to do, a feeling we want to know how to get out of this state of rebellion, rebellion. And we don't know because every rebellion we've tried has got a slap down or has given us a temporary reward which we sensed was not what we really wanted after all. So this morning we'll talk a little bit on one way to get out of the trap which is me, which is you. My own mind being the only trap there is. Agreed on that or is it someone else who's your problem? It's the own mind, isn't it? Those of you who like to write down might like to write the following sentence down. And then you will see the topic that we're going to go into for a while. The sentence is, dive into the dark while fearing to do so. Dive into the dark while fearing to do so. Now what does that mean? Diving into the dark means if you are called upon or requested maybe to give a little talk, you do your best with it. You either sit in your chair there and give us something for 30 seconds or you come up front. You do something that to you is a state of unfamiliarity of distress, of discomfort, of nervousness, or whatever. By consciously, deliberately, voluntarily doing some little thing you don't want to do. By going against your habitual self-protection, you dive into the dark, and for a while you're far worse off, you think, than you were before because you have left the cave in which you were huddling to venture out into something which you assume is the enemy, is the hostile place. If I can find, and I'm going to find, and you're going to try to find, a dozen ways each day to find an unfamiliar circumstance, and some of you I know are doing this, find an unfamiliar circumstance, find a new way of responding inside of it, so that I'm frightened at what I'm doing, but at the same time I'm quite conscious of what I'm doing. I'm shaking, but I know I'm shaking. Another example. You think this is far off. You think this is a thousand miles up in the heavenly sky. What we're doing is right here in this room. You come into the room and you sit down and you see a few other people sitting over there and over there. And the normal human tendency is to exchange glances to see whether they're looking at you and then maybe have a compulsion to say something. Because you're sitting here not liking the silence, and so you feel a compulsion to say something, say anything, to break the silence. Because that, for one minute, makes you feel comfortable. It doesn't at all, does it? Because then you speak nervously, or maybe gesture nervously, or both, to the other person. To dive into the dark in this particular instance would be to come into the room and just sit here quietly, being wide awake as to this lady sitting there and this lady and this man sitting there, maybe even looking at you. 
and you go against the compulsion to say something to smile at them even maybe but just sit there and take in the whole inner happening that is going on inside of you without breaking it It'll make you nervous oh won't it won't that make you uncomfortable this is diving into the dark which destroys what count on our fingers some of you mentioned it it destroys my mechanical way of behaving I've thrown the log in front of it which gives me a jolt but now I'm a bit more conscious than I was before it destroys my slavery to the other person it's really my own we know that but my slavery to the other person or to the atmosphere to the circumstance to think that I must behave in a certain way which will make me feel so I think secure make me feel in a familiar role so if I can find in my daily work with customers with the relatives a way to suddenly catch myself about to say something about to think something about to feel something it doesn't have to be something that the other person notices at all it can be a an inward state for example you can look at uh, someone and maybe be jealous of them or if it's a pretty woman feel sex desire toward her and then you see that your normal reaction would be to feel guilty about it feel ashamed of yourself or to feel as if you hope that you notice what you're thinking so you unconsciously put your hand over your face like I'm doing now and right in the center of it you can catch your hand going up and say you know that's an unconscious physical self-protective desire and you close your eyes and you try to appear casual because you think that they are reading your mind which they might be doing at that but that's not the point the point being I can catch my own reaction and I'll take my hand down and I will put my hands out like this and I'll sit here and watch the drama going on inside of me which will eventually put an end to it right now and a little weaker the next time this is what is known as diving into the dark <coughs> daily which means all day long instead of living in this pseudo comfort pseudo security false security I'm doing the most astonishing thing with myself that I've ever done which is all day long keep myself in a deliberately voluntarily nervous uncomfortable state with the aim the right aim of understanding what I am all about so as to put an end to the nervous wreck you know it's very easy for me to see this in you you to see it in someone else I have to see it in myself I have to see how I'm behaving at the time haven't you found it very easily to, easy to look at a person and see that they're in a wrong unnatural state see it without turning your attention back on yourself to see that you're in the same state so if I can put my attention both on you and on myself which by the way I am personally doing right now I'm listening to the sound of my voice how fast or slow I'm talking so I'm studying myself at this very moment that I'm talking to you I can see you quite clearly see some of your responses same time seeing how I'm reacting to it now I'm going to forget that and put my attention in another place see the exercise because if I can watch myself talking to myself as I am now and I can see I'm shaking my hand here or if I put my hands together in tension because I think that one of you is looking at me hard like I can catch that and I can dive into the dark of going against it which will produce a small shock in me which will break the chain isn't that nice that we can do that for ourselves
Okay? Where am I asleep? Where am I asleep? To my behavior every second. Where am I asleep to it? See it? Go against it? Drop it? Want to use the word defy? That's all right, too. Defy it? And listen to the scream of protest from it because it doesn't want to give you up. How many of you have been, have been negative in any way this morning? Just this morning. Have you been negative in any way? Any of you? Because you were asleep and didn't catch it. You, you don't. Look. You don't know what power you have. You don't know how you're tossing a thousand horsepower, psychic horsepower, out the window when you fail to watch yourself in action. This, to answer your question of earlier, is how we alternate back and forth between the, the jungle and home because we don't see that we can be there all the time. I can be there all the time unless I don't unless I lack the knowledge and the courage if I lack the courage to dive into the dark in the moment I see it and stay right there. Just a minute, please. Just a minute, please. Do you really want to be compulsive? Do you really want to be a reckless truck racing down the hill out of control with no driver, not knowing what you're going to strike next? Or you do, do you want to be in control of the machine, the entity, so that you guide it properly away from the telephone poles that we bumped into so many times and injured ourselves? This is the way to do it. This is how we come to be in control of this machine, this entity. So that it ceases, when a truck, when a racing truck downhill hits a telephone pole, it destroys both itself and the pole, does it not? <clears throat> Has to go together, does it not? So when I control the truck and it doesn't bump into a telephone pole anymore, I cease to hurt me and I cease to hurt it which means I'll cease to hurt all the people that are in my life, my relatives, people here in this group, my friends. I will cease to be an instrument for destruction, which I've been all my life. Because of the degree to which I've hurt myself, I've also hurt you. Haven't I? Huh? Now, you, now you know what a conscience is. How about having a conscience toward yourself from now on how about having a conscience you say oh, I must have a conscience towards someone else why don't you have one toward yourself why don't you be why don't you behave rightly toward yourself you're not divided from your wife or your friend you're not even divided from your enemy because you have made the enemy with your own thought he's an enemy to himself but not to you if you're wide awake and that would be a good place to dive into the dark while fearing to do so. How many of you have friend, uh, friends who are enemies? <laughs> How many of you have an human enemies? Uh, human enemies? Pardon? <laughs> In a minute, Joe. Every time you have an enemy, let me rephrase that. Every enemy you have is a poke on your, in your own jaw. I wish I could say that better. What's a better beak? <laughs> no. Every enemy you have is a slap at yourself. Go ahead, slap yourself. Or give up your love for having any enemy whatever on earth. 
give up having a person in your life who irritates you. You poor persecuted human being. How they irritate you and pick on you and persecute you. Go ahead, destroy yourself by having enemies. Why, why don't you set yourself free by this process we're talking about from every other human being on earth? Customers, clients, relatives, so that you have a conscience toward yourself and therefore one toward them. You know how you have, you know how you have a conscience toward an idiot? toward a madman, toward an irritating person. You know how you have a conscience? By being free inside your own mind. Then you can be trapped on the bus, on the airplane, next to that blabbermouth man, that complaining woman, and you can sit there and listen to her or his horror story for two hours without it harming you because you're not taking it in irritation and besides you'll know how to handle it on the everyday level because you're not required to sit there and listen to that mad story which he or she has told a thousand times before it might even be another vacant seat you'll know how to handle the whole situation by having a conscience toward a person who has no conscience so that you're not adding to the horror story unconsciously yourself you know you, you know what a coward is I'll tell you what a coward is now, and by this definition you tell me whether you're a coward or not someone is talking to you complaining telling you how badly they've been treated and how if only their ideas were enacted into law, what a better world it would be. And they're behaving insanely or very badly. And you sit there without nodding, without agreeing. You can listen and be very attentive, acknowledging that they're talking without agreeing. Them. And don't you dare nod your head once. Because that's your cowardice. Right? Can't you look at them without agreeing? You're trapped. You're in the next seat. You will refuse, effective as of this morning, to agree with insanity. You will refuse absolutely the other person and in you. And they're not divided, are they? They're one thing. Otherwise, you were the cause of that horrible war which hurt little children and old men and old women and made them suffer and starve. I'm not being sentimental. I'm stating a fact. When you nod your head just slightly to that neurotic who's telling you all these things, you nod your head once, you're the cause of the horror of the world. Yes, you are then you're going to stop doing it. You're going to start having a real conscience. You're going to stop agreeing with madness. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Fine. Would you like to talk this morning now for a while? How many of you have had uh, critical ideas toward me personally about the way this class is conducted? Any of you had critical uh, critical ideas? May you see your hands, please? 
I'm going to remember those. <laughs> remember, you said toward the way the class is conducted. What has been your reaction to your own thought about that? See, now, no. see, you're all you're all wide awake now. All of a sudden, you're wide awake. Did you watch yourself at the same time you were critical? Let's go to an extreme example on this. We're changing the subject a little bit. A new person, some new person, might come in this class sometime, and he'll have a, a wide background of studies in, in uh, metaphysics or the Bible or self-development or hypnosis or whatever. He have a tremendous amount of knowledge. I will tell you that when that person comes here, I will tell you all about him or her, which he or she does not know about himself or herself. Completely unconscious, and he or she would deny it if I said it, but I'm going to say it. He or she is quite sure that he could conduct the class in a much better way be a far more effective teacher, give people far more, be far more acceptable to the class, make it far more interesting. But unfortunately, this person is thinking, I'm not appreciated. I'm not asked to teach the class. And this is the way it's always been. As smart as I am, no one wants my brilliance. And that person goes from here probably, probably never to come back again because they sat here in a state of sleep not even knowing what was going on in their own mind. Now, you have criticism toward me. What's going on in your mind? You know, one reason we have these talks, one reason we have these talks on Sunday is so that you can get up here and be as stupid as you actually are. Hmm. Yeah. Because if you can be very watchful of how nervous you are and how inadequate you are and how you're sitting here, standing there, wondering what you're going to say next, and looking at a particularly, the most valuable per when you're giving a talk, the most valuable person is the sourpuss out there, the critical one, right? Huh? The smiler is no good. They make you falsely confident. So you can watch your own behavior standing up here, and maybe it will knock some of the vanity out of your mind that you're so smart, right? Questions, comments? In that case, I will tell you something nice. It's nice to be in a state where you don't know what's happening to you. Not when you're driving your car in the fog. You better do the best you can to know what's happening to you. Or taking care of your yard, you better know what's happening, what will happen if you don't water the peach tree. But it's a wonderful state to be in, plunging into the dark, when you don't have an answer, when you don't know what's happening to you. Isn't that tremendous? Great? Isn't it great not to have an answer? Isn't it unique? Then we ruin it all by grabbing an answer. He got mad at me. I know the answer. 
get mad back. My business is slipping downhill. I know what to do. Blame someone for it. The competitor. I get fired. I know what the answer is. Fall into self-pity. Be bitter. Why don't you find out what happens to you the next time you have a crisis or a problem? Why don't you find out what happens when you don't grab an answer, a solution? Find out what happens to you. It will make you a nervous wreck. Great. You're in the dark. Stay there, then don't you grab an answer and say, this is the light. Are you following? You're following, aren't you? Because then you won't have the light at all, but you'll have an idea which you call the light. And an idea is never the light. An idea, a thought, is never the light. Thought can never see the answer. Something above that can see the answer. It can see both sides of the coin at once. And that's the answer. You, you, never see the answer. You are the answer. Right? Clear? No? If you see the answer... It's not the answer. Because you are seeing the answer. Which is not the answer. <laughs> when you and the answer are the same thing, that's the answer. Maybe we better think a little bit. Okay. Very easy. Remember the answer you had after your last crisis? Remember the solution you had after that last problem? It tore you apart, didn't it? Because it was no answer at all. It was a movement of thought, of feeling, of desire, a movement of anxiety there's no answer at all it may have temporarily pushed the problem out of the way I'm lonely that's my crisis I'm so lonely so you find a friend and you're still lonely what if you went to work on the problem of loneliness whether you had a friend or not whether you had a friend or not, you went to work on understanding loneliness itself. Do you know why you feel lonely? You feel lonely because you feel lonely. If you didn't feel lonely, you wouldn't feel lonely. <laughs> Isn't that true? Huh? You can't beat logic like that. we're sort of lazy after a while we get lazy we just like to feel lonely and we don't want to feel anything else you know we're kind of lazy anyhow so we might as well feel like feel lonely and not yeah. make any effort to break it yeah right just remain in the state without making an effort to understand it because there's a certain false value in feeling lonely isn't there you know what the false value is you should know it by this time which is this i am so lonely oh what a starring role you have created for yourself. The lonely lady, you see it in marquees on the theater. The lonely lady, you're the star of the show. We've been, we've been conditioned to believe that aloneness means loneliness. 
even today, all of the, you'll hear them say to the elderly, get out and be with older, other people, associate, then you won't be lonely. It's a, a habit, yeah. a tradition. Oh, sure, sure. That's the answer society always gives. Get involved, get a hobby. <laughs> so you collect stamps and you hate it. <laughs> and you're still lonely. Yeah, you're still lonely, yeah. Do you suppose truth could ever be lonely? Why don't you become truth? Become truth, become truth, and then you'll never be lonely again. Then you'll have friends or don't have friends, but you won't be lonely. You'll be self-sufficient, which is not self-enclosure. Real self-sufficiency has no self-enclosure. So now we have to understand self-enclosure. Tied up in my safe quote marks safe quote marks safe little world and look how unsafe you feel in your safe little world so some of you who sit at the back in this room should someday sit in the front to make yourself feel anxious what a small project that is find bigger ones Some of you who feel more secure by sitting at the front, sit at the back. <laughs> I don't care what happens to me as long as I learn something from it and grow from it. Right? I don't care what happens to me as long as I can learn from it and grow inwardly from it therefore are you going to reject any experience that comes to you anything at all are you going to reject anything or are you going to wisely use it it really is a feeling of exposure sitting up front because the realization is that you can see everything there even a flicker of an eyebrow and it's, you feel exposed There's all kind of little things going on between myself and you as the audience, isn't there? All you're watching me very carefully, very carefully. I'm watching you very carefully. same time I'm watching you carefully I'm watching me carefully <clears throat> same time you're watching me you should be having your attention also on what is going on in you as a result of watching me you can learn from that learn all sorts of things providing vanity doesn't stand in the way either one of us Isn't it tremendous that we have the word no, you know, in this case, you know. So I'm nervous, lonely, distressed, afraid. And I have this one very small part of me that says no to it. All the other parts scream, yes, you have to be nervous, you should be nervous. You should be tense. A small part of me screams, that's not the right word, scream, but I'll use it. Screams, no, I don't have to live this way anymore. I don't have to destroy myself as I have done in the past. That's not too strong a word to say you've destroyed yourself or I've destroyed myself. They should get words that have emotional meaning to them so that they hit you hard. How have you destroyed yourself since you came 
since you got up this morning, how have you destroyed yourself? By feeling bad over something? Why do you feel bad over anything? Why don't you simply understand the state instead of feeling bad about it, which means you didn't understand it? Anything you feel bad over, you can't understand and be free of. What do you feel bad about? That the uh, boy or girl you went to high school with years ago, he or she, she's married to a nice prominent doctor who makes a lot of money and she has nice clothes and house and she's Mrs. Dr. Jones or whatever. Or he now is very successful in his business or whatever. And that's what you feel bad about because you're the same age and you're a financial flop and you've had two divorces that's what you feel bad about why don't you wake up right now why don't you wake up right now and knock off that nonsense and that stupidity and that self-destruction why don't you knock it off right now and they have nothing more to do with it Why don't you say no in the right way? How many of you are slaves to society? You like being a slave to, to your insane keepers? You're, you like being a captive to your insane jailers you like that apparently you do because you stay in that state when you wish you were rich and famous or successful or popular or had a good reputation apparently you love your chains Apparently you value, apparently you value your neurotic friends and relatives more than you value the truth that could set you free. You know that brother-in-law of yours? You value his goodwill toward you by nodding when he makes that mad statement? You value that more than you value your own sanity? What on earth is the matter with us? You have, you have a false conscience, among other things. False ideas of loyalty. You're going to be loyalty. You're going to be loyal to the insane asylum? You're going to remain part of it? Which doesn't mean you criticize or hurt anyone. It means right where you are in the midst of the insane asylum you live your own life sanely why do you let why do you let mad people influence you and dominate you and make you think that they know what they're talking about why have you abandoned your own mind to the authority, to the, the powerful person. Why have you abandoned yourself? Why are you such suckers? Why are you, why are you so weak and cowardly and gullible?
Don't you want to be yourself? The next time you smile at anyone, you're to smile consciously instead of unconsciously. Because that will not be wrong. I'm saying that effective as of now, you will no longer smile in agreement at madness. Walk out for heaven's sake. Walk out while being afraid of doing so. And you will start by not nodding at the man next to you in the bus or airplane or wherever you fall into a conversation. you start to destroy your own madness get rid of it so that we're no longer mad thinking we're sane so we no longer destroy the world saying we're saving it so that I no longer have to think of how to behave when I come into your presence. I will know how to behave because I won't be there at all. There will be capital U understanding there instead of me because I've been there long enough. I've stood there long enough nervously wanting to please you I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to be there, but I'm going to understand the whole situation without a nervous compulsion to behave the way that I think protects my images. I'm going to have the courage to drop the images and not be there at all so that I can really understand them. going to be ashamed of any mistake I make while trying to reach this state because that's just another mistake to be ashamed of myself I'm not ashamed if I accidentally hit my hand with a hammer when driving a nail I'm not ashamed I see it was a mistake and I try to be aware so that I don't repeat it be ashamed would be stupid that would block my understanding that my hand should hit over here instead of over there so I'm going to take do the same thing with my inner blunders or if I make a mistake toward you I'm not going to be ashamed of it at all I'm not going to feel guilty I'm going to look at it and understand that I was temporarily taken over because I was asleep taken over by a mechanical unconscious force that made me behave like an idiot And I'm not going to identify with being an idiot, but see the process. Drop it right now. The next time, I won't behave that way quite as badly as before. I'm so tired of being your slave, boss, wife, husband, patient, customer. I'm so sick and tired of being your slave. <laughs> 